Hello, everyone. This is Sean from the Soccer Nostalgia blog. I have the pleasure to interview Mr. Runar Nordwick. Mr. Nordwick is the head of media at Norwegian club FK Hogesund and a former football journalist. This interview is separate from a podcast series. This video interview will serve as a companion piece to a written blog presentation on the Norway versus France Euro qualifier on June 16, 1987, looked from a Norwegian perspective. Mr. Nordwick was interviewed previously on the blog regarding Norway's historic 1981 World Cup qualifying win over England. Hello, Mr. Norwick. Thank you. For Hello, this good, morning. good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you describe the state of affairs in Norwegian football in the tail end of the 1980s? I think it was a little bit disillusional. I think, except for the odd, strong result, which happened every other year, the Norwegian national team hadn't provided anything in terms of. Uh, results or anything that was signaling that um, they would ever qualify for a major tournament or something like that. Um, at this point, the Norwegian team, they had beaten Argentina in a friendly the year before. But other than that, I think more or less every game in terms of results uh, had been a disappointment. And people had, I wouldn't say they had lost faith because... Uh, this had been going on for such a long time, so I think the expectations was very, very low towards this uh, national team at this point. Now, while a match against France could not have had the historical or cultural importance as the match against England in 1981, was it nevertheless regarded with some interest as France were the defending Euro champions of 1984? Oh, yes, definitely. France, they had played in the semi-final and the World Cup prior to this and had been a dominant force in European and world football for many years uh, leading up to this. So even despite everyone knew that uh, there was a generation, a new generation of players coming through in France and they had to rebuild their team and the French national team was still considered a big happening when they would uh, come to face Norway. As we might come back to later on, France were in a very difficult situation at this point, but as far as the size of the match, I think this one uh, was probably one of the biggest matches in the latter part of the 80s, simply due to not as much the players that would arrive from France for this match, but the players that had represented them 10, 12 years leading up to this. Can you tell me where you were in life around this time? Uh, at this point, I was uh, 15 or 16, 16, 15, I think. I was a very ambitious footballer back home in uh, Norwegian city, just outside of Oslo. Very, very dedicated to football. It was everything that mattered at the time. And, uh, well, I was uh, like more or less all of my friends, very dedicated to either playing football or following international football i was reading everything this was prior to the internet so you had to get information elsewhere but i was reading football mags and well i think more or less my entire life was focused on football at this point so it was such such a sort of a mid phase between being a kid and a, a grown up so um it was probably in terms of being at traditional football fan at the peak of my football supporting activities. Now, can you describe the performances of Norway in their Euro qualifying group up to that point? Well, I had been, as far as I remember them, we were, we had lost, I think, or we, we had one point uh, from the three opening fixtures, I think, at this point. Had lost twice to the Soviet Union, 
which of course wasn't that big of a surprise considering the, the Soviet Union was a very, very good team at the point at the time. And we had managed a draw against East Germany, which was another game that I was uh, present at. A, a little bit unfortunate that we didn't win that game, as if I remember it correctly. But uh, at this point in this qualification, we were already focused on just getting some single great results because we knew that uh, we wouldn't be able to qualify with that opening of the uh, qualification group and that by uh, more or less every, I think everyone knew that this was going to be Soviet Union going through from our group towards the end of the qualification. Norway manager Tor Rostfossen, in an interview with the French magazine Mondial, he expressed some worry that his foreign base players were usually confined to the bench. What was the press view regarding the players' limited opportunities? I think he was quite spot on. Uh, we had a few very good players, well, well, not very good, because, uh, but by Norwegian standards, some good up-and-coming players that had traveled abroad. One player headed off to Nottingham Forest in England, but couldn't get much of a playing time so and I think from the from the starting lineup in this uh, fixture I think he had to make a lot of uh, compromises players that would normally be part of a um, starting lineup was uh, starting the game on the bench as substitutes simply due to he couldn't field too many players that was struggling with playing time in their uh, various clubs throughout uh, Europe. I th- quite a lot of the players at the time in the squad, I, I, said, I think a few, quite a few of the players even didn't reach, uh, get to the squad uh, for this fixture due to the fact that they uh, hadn't played a competitive match at club level for many, 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 many months. So um, that was a real issue at the time uh, that uh, our most significant players was uh, struggling with uh, playing time. Just two days before this match, on June 14th, it was announced that uh, Norway manager Tor Rostfossen would be replaced by the Swede Tord Grip. How was this news viewed at the time? I think, uh, as, I, as far as I remember it, I think everyone thought that it was about time to... Uh, do some changes in terms of uh, replacing Rusty Fossen as the national team coach. Uh, he had been staying in the job for a very long time, never managed to get us qualified for any tournaments. So I think everyone appreciated a new approach. And in terms of Tord Grip specifically, I don't think many knew that much about him to say anything in terms of this was a good appointment or a bad appointment but uh, but I think everyone more or less welcomed the change because something had to be done we have been going on for 10 12 years with the uh, the same approach and the same staff surrounding the national team and to a certain extent also the same players so I think everyone knew that we were going to get somewhere uh, we had to uh, not start all over but uh, had to do uh, some adjustments uh, in the staff so i think everyone thought that it was a good idea to uh, get a new head coach that would probably shake things around a little bit so now let's look at this match on june 16th 1987 at oslo at ulleval stadium so let's tr- take a look at the lineups. For Norway, in goal, we have Erik Thorsvet, who's playing at IFK Gothenburg in Sweden, who had just won the UEFA Cup, but Thorsvet was not a starter yet for IFK. In defense, we have Hans Henriksen, who's playing in the French second division at Gangon. Terje Kojedal, also in the French second division at Mulhouse. 
We have Anders Gisk of Nuremberg in West Germany. Per Egil Alsen of Bran. Jan Berg of Mold. Per Mort of IFK Gutenberg in Sweden. Arve Selad in the French second division at Mulhus. He'd be replaced by Kjetil Oswald of Nottingham Forest in England in the 62nd minute. Up front, you have Jorn Andersson of Nuremberg. He'd be replaced by Eric Soler of Bran in the 89th minute. Tom Sunbi of Iraklis in Greece. And captain of the team, Halvar Thorsen of PSV Eindhoven in Holland. For France, this was their first match post the retirement of Michel Platini. For France, and as you mentioned, since the 1986 World Cup, many of the stars had retired, such as Alain Gires, Maxime Bossis, Dominic Rocheteau, and soon after this match, Jean Tigana and Patrick Battiston would also retire. It was a France in decline with many younger younger players, inexperienced players. So for France, managed by Henri Michel, we have the following lineup. In goal, Joël Batz of Paris Saint-Germain. In defense, Jean-Christophe Touvenel of Bordeaux. Basile Bolli of Auxerre. Jean-François Domergue of Marseille. Manuel Amoros of Monaco. Jean-Marc Ferreri of Bordeaux. Captaining the team, Jean Tigana of Bordeaux, Gérald Passy of Toulouse, Fabrice Pouyan of Paris Saint-Germain, he be replaced by Patrick de la Montagne of Laval in the 80th minute, Yannick Stopira of Toulouse, Carmelo Mixish of Metz, and he be replaced by Philippe Fargeon of Bordeaux in the 75th minute. As far as the match... It would be scoreless until halftime. With less than 20 minutes remaining, Norway takes the lead. After a clearance, Thorsen lobbed the ball back into the box. Joel Butts attempted to clear the ball, but he missed his attempt and more took advantage and scored. With 10 minutes remaining in a match, Norway doubled the lead. From the Norwegian defense on the left side, a long cross was sent and it reached Anderson, who went on to score the second. And Norway were victorious. Before we discuss the match itself, can you tell where you were when you watched this match and your reaction at the time? I was in the stands, I remember. I had already been to the opening home fixture against the East Germany. I was, uh, of course, when uh, the France would come to Norway, I was, and I was just living outside of Oslo. It was such a short distance uh, to actually see them live from the stands. It was uh, an obvious occasion for me to go and actually see this uh, game. So I remember uh, probably more than most other Norwegian this game quite good. I'm not entirely sure. I've, I've been to uh, a handful of matches with the national team afterwards, but this was probably the last team with the national team that I watched from the stands for many years after this. So I have a very had a very clear view to the uh, to this uh, feature and I remember it. It was quite heavily influenced by terrible weather. So you mentioned uh, Joel Batz on the opening goal. He was doing a terrible mistake, which was partly caused by uh, the conditions. I think he slips or something like that when he's uh, trying to intervene this pass, and uh, he more or less gives away the opening goal, as far as I remember. How was your feeling about the general flow of the match? Uh, before Norway scored, did you feel that Norway could win this match? Absolutely. I think we were quite good on the occasion. I think expectation was 
pretty low. Uh, everyone knew that this was a vulnerable French team. I think also, uh, if I remember correctly, that Jean Tigana, he had, like his companions Platini and Jerez, announced his retirement uh, prior to this game. But he was brought back. He accepted uh, getting back due to the France suffering a lot of injuries. So they were without uh, a couple of strong names that they would usually play. There was some sort of sense that this was a doable for the Norwegian team because this was a this was a more or less brand new French team. You, you can watch that and watch the team, the French team, and you see a lot of good names. And but there was also a couple of names there where which would never appear for France again. So they were obviously trying their way. Michel, he was trying to compose a brand new French team, more or less from scratch. So despite a lot of good players there, I remember Gérald Passy, he was very good at, uh, at the game, but he was struggling with the weather conditions, I remember. But uh, the Norwegian team was, we were more like, our kind of football was uh, probably more convenient on the day. We were just trying to kick it up to our strikers, who was trying to, uh, who, who was supposed to... Uh, just we were playing this, this uh, sort of British style football, and uh, so the conditions was probably in our favor on the day. And I think we had created a lot of chances as well prior to actually scoring. But um, so I, I think it was a deserved lead at the point. I can't really remember France creating that much. I think they found it I think they would prefer to be elsewhere because they knew as well that the qualification for the tournament in um, the Euro tournament uh, the year after was more or less already gone they had lost their opening fixtures against Soviet Union or something like that so they knew it would be very difficult and the condition was not very good so um, you could see that they were they played it because they had to, but there wasn't that much effort put in by their players uh, at the time, as far as I remember. So I think up until the 70 minute when Pered Munmort scores, I think it uh, we had been the um, the best team on the day. So it was a deserved lead. And uh, but it was uh, there was a, when he named the Norwegian. There was a, quite a few players there, so I wasn't very aware of actually did start. For instance, Oliver Seilan, he was. Uh, one over to forwards, and he was uh, at the time he had just been sold to France. I remember he had uh, had a good season back home in Norway and was joining Mulhouse in France. And uh, he was actually starting uh, this game. This must have been one of his last appearances for Norway because he was very short term and he was injured shortly after and he had to retire at a young age. And again, I think our head coach had to do a lot of compromises when he composed the. Norwegian national team, but it worked out on the on the day, as far as I remember the the game from the stands. Afterwards, was the hype over this win more grounded than in 1981 against England? Because, like we mentioned, at this point, France were a declining team, having lost many of its stars. Absolutely. I don't think anyone put any further into this fix than the typical occasional win uh, against a good opponent by a Norwegian team. I think everyone knew that this wasn't really the start of anything because most of these players had been playing uh, for the Norwegian national team for a long time. And I think this was a generation that people knew never would really make it a couple of youngsters there coming up like Jan Berg but he would be he wouldn't be part of the Norwegian national team for a very long time Alves Seilan was another as I already mentioned and up front we had Jörn Andersen who was uh, he would later on become uh, the first foreign player to ever become top scorer in the German Bundesliga he would lose his place in the Norwegian national team and never appear again a few years later on uh, when he was, in fact, the reigning top scorer in German Bundesliga. So I don't think... I think everyone was more or less uh, looking forward to the new regime, hoping that it would cause... create something 
but uh, everyone knew that toilet grip would be in for a very difficult task trying to co- compose a team and create a, a spirit that was that would lead us uh, to a tournament so uh, there wasn't that much euphoria concerning this victory yes and in fact in terms of the international press the general takeaway was that this was more a reflection on France and yeah. the fact that they had fallen off their perch, basically. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, you mentioned that there was not much hype, but do you still think there was no feeling that Norway could build upon this win? Or were people more realistic? I think people, people had spent the last 10 12 years, well, even even further on, uh, being uh, disappointed so many times. And I don't think people necessarily knew where um, the new players would come from, because this was more or less the best we had. We had, as I mentioned, a few players that wasn't getting playing time at club level that you could introduce. And I'm a little bit... I'm surprised that, uh, for instance, Rune Bratset wasn't part of this team. I w- would have believed he was, but he must have been injured or something like that because he, at this point he was starting to uh, become uh, one of the best central defenders in Europe. So there, there was a couple of decent players there. The goalkeeper was very good, Erik Forsvett. Rune Bratzet, as I mentioned, but a lot of these players you mentioned, they played in second at second level in France and sort of speaks volumes in terms of uh, the lack of uh, of players. Even Todd Grip could uh, turn into uh, contenders for a major tournament. People yeah. were hoping, but didn't expect anything. Todd Grip certainly was unable to get the maximum of his new group. Was there a feeling that the decision to appoint him and replace Fosen may have been hasty? Uh, well, after after a while, I think most people started regretting that Todd Grip was given the job because he is infamous for never winning a single match as the national head coach of Norway. He's, he remained in the post for just a year until he left uh, for a club in uh, Switzerland or something like that, as I remember. So he's been a little bit ridiculed afterwards for uh, not being a very good coach, which is obviously very um, this is a huge mistake because he proved himself later on the assistant of Sven Göran Eriksson and Tommy Svensson and that uh, he's um, <clears throat> indeed a very, very good coach, but he lost, I think, in his first match, he managed to lose against Iceland, which was completely unheard of. Yeah, he lost twice against Iceland. So. Yeah, he lost <laughs> twice against Iceland, and after that, there was no way back. So he doesn't have uh, any <laughs> fond memories from Norway, I think, and Norwegian doesn't have that much of... Uh, fond memories of his he's probably most known for uh, a quote he came up with during his reign as a head coach that he had uh, by traveling around watching Norwegian football he had seen a lot of fancy cars owned by players but he had uh, not seen that many fancy players I think things stormed quite fast after him taking charge because results didn't go his way and well, I think it speaks volumes that he decided to depart after just one year anyway, that he wasn't really into this and he didn't see how to take it further anyway. So, But I don't think anyone re- really regrets the change, but probably should have found someone more suited, which would have been very difficult anyway. Let's discuss the Norwegian players on that day. And the trajectory of some of those players. Obviously, most English Premier League fans know Eric Thorsvet for his time at Tottenham. Let's discuss some of the others. Hans Henriksen and let's say Terje Kojudal in defense. What do you remember from their trajectories? 
Uh, Hans Hermann Henriksen, he's sort of a cult player. He was at the time. I don't think that many people remember him now because he is one of very few Norwegian that has never played football at a high club level back home in Norway. He went abroad very young, went to the United States and then further on to France to play for a lot of lower leagues, uh, league teams for many years. Except for these appearances on the national team, he was really the old man out because no one knew that much about him. So he was a kind of a journeyman traveling around, enjoying life and the lower leagues in France. And I remember him as a player with a lot of commitment, but with uh, probably quite limited on skills. But he had found a path that suited him. He was, I, th I think, quite pleased with just uh, enjoying life as a football player in France. And, and um, that was probably the best thing he could have uh, hoped for. So... He will never play at top level in France, but he went on to play uh, until he was in the mid-30s or something like that for various uh, French clubs. As for Tali Koydal, he was is a familiar name to most Norwegians at my generation. He was a very good player uh, back home in Norway and went to France to play for two various clubs. And I think he achieved promotion with the, the both of them. I'm not really sure if he ever played at high level at the, at, in League A with the, either of them, but he managed to get them both promoted. And then after a few years, he returned to Norway and uh, retired at a, quite a young age. Not necessarily at a young age, but uh, shortly after returning to Norway. He had played in France for three or four years and called it a day soon after he returned to Norway. So his career would be, um, wouldn't last that much longer after this, I, as far as I remember. Anders Jysk had a successful spell in the Bundesliga, playing for a number of teams, apart from Nuremberg. He played at Bayer Leverkusen and also Köln towards the tail end of his career when Köln were still a, a fairly decent side. Herr Alsen, he had a short spell in the Bundesliga, but he mainly played in Norway. Uh, Jan Berg had some spells in Spain. The goal scorer, Mort, he had a number of years at IFK Gutenberg, but then he returned to Norway. Selan that you mentioned, yeah, he played at uh, Mulhouse. Then he also played in Belgium. But yeah, he I think this was one of his last matches for Norway. He only earned 10 caps for the national team. What do you think about Kjetil Oswald, who Brian Clough signed him for Nottingham Forest, but uh, he made very few appearances in a number of years. Yeah, I think uh, he had to at the time when he went abroad was at a very good level and everyone expected him to become probably the next main significant player from Norway. But things didn't work out uh, in uh, Nottingham Forest and he went on loan to Leicester City and then he went on to play in Sweden, which I think he did quite well actually in Sweden. But he would never get to the level that um, everyone expected when he was in his prime. So the move abroad would uh, turn out, uh, I wouldn't say a mistake because it was obvious that he would take the opportunity when it arrived, but Nottingham Forest turned out a bad choice for him. And uh, he could have reached, I think he was playing in Greece as well, if I don't remember it. Yes, at Pauk, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so he can look back and at, uh, at, at a nice career, but don't think he consider it fulfilled in terms of his qualities when he was at his best, because he was a very good player back home in Norway and formed at the national team, he was supposed to form the new midfield together with his companion from Rilström, uh, Tom Sundby, who was uh, another very, very good player um, playing in Greece as well at a club that is now uh, more or less wiped off 
the um, football map, but at the time they were playing in the top level in Greece. And Tom Zumbi was a very, very good player, but would suffer a terrible injury uh, shortly after this, a couple of years after this. So those two were supposed to take uh, the Norwegian national team into the future, sort of, but it didn't work out that way. And not that many years after this, both of them would uh, would never wouldn't be part of the Norwegian national team anymore. So, bro, of, of these players, as we as you went through, the only one that, as far as I remember, uh, the only one that survived the new reign of Egil Drill Olsen, who would come in uh, three years later on, was Erik Torsvet. And of course, Rune Bratset, who wasn't playing this actual game, but he was part of this generation. Uh, other than that, uh, more or less everyone uh, was uh, uh, written off as national team players. Yes. And you mentioned Jorn Andersson. He spent a decade in Germany, but uh, he was discarded uh, by 1990, uh, despite having a good goal scoring record in Germany. There's Eric Soler. He also had a short spell in Germany with Hamburg for like a year. He also did not gain any more caps beyond 1988. No, no, he was yeah. uh he was I think there's quite a lot of players here who, who at this point was in their latter half of their twenties. So a couple of these players would uh could have gone Further on, and to play for the Norwegian national team for five, six, seven years, but most of these names was replaced shortly after. There was after Todd. It should be mentioned that after Todd Grip, there was another Norwegian head coach for a short time, Ingvar Stadheim, who went on with a lot of these players uh, during his reign. Uh, didn't work out and uh, decided to withdraw in nineteen. 19- 90 when when uh, Egil Drill Olsen came in and the first thing he did was to axe more or less every player that had been involved in the national team and just keeping a few two or three major uh, young uh, significant players like Vratzet and Torsvet and replace the, the remaining lot with uh, players from the up and coming under 21 team uh, which had been quite successful in international competitions and it turned out a very good move, of course. And let's also mention a captain, Halvar Thorson, who was coming at the end of a, a successful career in Holland with PSV Eindhoven. At this point, he was no longer first choice. This was a PSV Eindhoven that were about to become uh, one of the best in Europe. As far as the national team, I believe this was his last match or one of certainly one of the last matches. I believe his last match was in 1987. Yeah, he he also suffered an injury. He could also have played on for quite a long time. He was a very good player. I don't think anyone today really remembers how good Halvard Wilson actually was in terms of international standard. But he was also the only one besides... Pushtvet and Bratzet that was playing, uh, who was considered the very, very good players in Europe. and But he was injured shortly after this game and never came back either at club or uh, national team level. So just like last time in England in 1981, there were no tangible improvements in the immediate aftermath. And... Norway would have to wait a few years until, like you mentioned, Eril Olsen came where he installed a new generation. I'm assuming, yeah, as a result, like you mentioned, this win is more or less an anomaly in that sense. Yes. um, This was, as I mentioned, the odd game out where we could create good results Reminding players that on some special locations we could more or less be able to beat anyone, but uh, there were too many matches in between those that uh, reflected our um, real level. So I remember this match, but I think um, 
if, if I remember it correctly as well, as a, there was uh, when we played Iceland shortly after Todd Grip had taken charge of the Norwegian national team. Um, I think there was only four or five thousand spectators at Ullevål, despite him being the brand new coach. So at this point, there was just uh, people was had just come to terms with the fact that we weren't go- going places. So it had to take a nutty professor some years into the future to change that. So in closing, do you think this match is remembered by football historians or do you think it's lost in the sands of time? Uh, it's lost in the sense of time. Those who were present remember it, remembers it. It's remembered because it was Torres de Fossen's last fixture by many, I think. But in general, it's um, it's for the football historians. If, if you just stop an ordinary Norwegian on the street and ask him or her to recapture a win against France in 1987, I don't think many will be able to do it because this is not considered the one of the really historic historical games in Norway, Norwegian football history, but a, a decent decent result and uh, for those who were present, it was um, like me, was a game I remember quite uh, vividly still with that i would like to thank you once again for this interview urge everyone to please read the main blog article as well for more detail the link is included in the video upload description along with our respective contact information so thank you once more my pleasure my pleasure